And sometimes we strip it all back and it, it starts to seem kind of dull and boring and, and look like really specific methods that you must follow in all circumstances. Well, back in the 60s, the Zion Methods movement already tried to do that. They were mean, they were mean, they were mean that they were intending, and this is, the, this is really the emergence of discipline of design, to make explicit the methods that already existed in practice, but so other people could find out what they were. Unfortunately, it all fell apart because they tried to get the design method, and John Chris Jones and a couple of other people just walked away and said, no, that was never the intent. It was just about making some of what we do explicit. Now, that could be seen in a vacuum as just what designers were doing, but at the same moment, Herbert Simon, Nobel Prize winning economist, writes his book, The Science of the Artificial, and says, you know, design is a really important, organised, rigorous body of knowledge. But he did say in the 69 it needs to do some work on making it explicit. So when it comes from both inside and outside, you know there's a job to be done. Lifting the veil, where it runs into problems is two areas. Um, in business, if you lift the veil too much, you tell people how you do things. So there's always, and design, unlike engineering, architecture, and law doesn't have a formal professional body that protects its members. So there's always been a degree to which designers and professional practice have protected their tacit knowledge, because if they tell people they need all their competitors are going to do the same thing. IDO have a very smart way of, I think, really using explicit knowledge, but visualising it in an interesting way, perhaps adapting it a little bit. But often when I look at their processes, I can, I can almost tell where their explicit knowledge comes from and you can get the articles. But they are very good and they are innovating. They're using theories, adapting them, trying them. And, you know, theory and methods don't can lead practice, but equally practice can lead to theories and methods. So I think that, that, that even so, even at the industry level, those things emerging. Um, but I, as an educator and someone in the university committed to advancing the discipline, I'd rather see a little bit more explicit knowledge. But I think that's why business is important because they they sort of know what they're getting. They they get oh, there's all these tools, you know, and oh look, they're all laid out in cards, and oh look, they relate it to a map and. That to me is business language in a sense, but it's also something I think the design community should be able to do a little bit more elegantly. Um, I, I think they flail around a lot. Um, IDO are sort of profligate borrowers and, you know, of, of other disciplines' tactics and then representing them as this design process. But they neglect to mention they've got teams of you know, very experienced anthropologists who do all this, and you know, I think it's been sold as a, a, a quite dirty way of, of of actually focusing on the user, and it does keep the user at the centre of the process, I think that's very good, but it can be an excuse uh, for, for what I'd call superficial observation. Um, so yeah, what IDEO do is they're trying to put forward an open source method, but um, they don't they don't give away their secrets. You know, is that well, what actually do they do? And really, the secrets are in the insights and the intelligence of the people involved in the process and the experience of those people. It's not it's not the process per se. I mean, I think it gives. From education, if that was your question, then it's very interesting that those methods are given rather than saying, "Here's a design project, go and do it." You know, which is what the full immersion schools would do ten years ago, fifteen years ago. Um, but slowly, all this methodology is seeping in. And yet, what I do like about um, yeah, IDEO is that they're just saying, "Look, there are all these tools." match these tools to the context. So you, there's still this magic of deciding what sort of model you're going to use. or um, It's not a process that's appropriate to every situation. And that the designerly thinking is, is adapting the process to the context, I think. Yeah, I think that's how it's said. Mm. So we start with people rather than things. Um, and it's what do people need, what do they desire, and then if we start from there, it shouldn't matter what we design, we don't come and say we're graphic designers, we're going to design a poster, 
we say what's the need, what do people want, what do they desire, and often they don't know exactly. They know what they have and improvements on what they have, but that sort of breakthrough into innovation is something they can't conceive of because they haven't got in front of them. That's where design comes in. I've always talked about the difference between um, yeah, consumer applied science, consumer focus, that's very narrow in terms of the people who purchase things. User-centred broadens it out to all the users, not just necessarily the people involved in the financial transaction. Human-centred is about people at its broader sense. The two key aspects I thought out of Scandinavian design, which was co-design and participatory design. Now, there's a bit of debate about what the difference is, but I think I, I see co-design as a higher level and participatory as a secondary. Participatory means you bring the users into the process and they inform the design, um, but they may not actually design it. Co-design, they are there right from the start designing for it. Now that might seem abstract, but when I talk to someone from Scott Technology who tells me he's designing robotic welders, and he says, oh, we've started bringing our clients in because they're small scale manufacturers and we produce these for all sorts of companies, but they have to run them and maintain them, and sometimes they're a bit complex or complicated, so we get them in to see if we can refine them to their needs, and I said, well, that's participatory design. And he went, oh, is it? Good. You know, but they were doing it already, and then I said, and he said, but increasingly we've been thinking about getting them in to design new products, and actually, you know, specifically for their needs. That, that would be hard for them because they're not a big manufacturer, like Dunford Watts, the funded the Denmark University, but he said, you know, and I said, well, that's co-design.